So I reached out to some patients, and I told them about the hackathon. I reached out to my friend Nancy, who lives in um, Texas. And she's like, that's so cool, Dr. Seward, that they're doing that. And she's like, you need to call me right now. And so, and the reason I was reaching out to my patients was to ask them for ideas about what might work for them in terms of technology. I, I contacted my, my friend Izzy, who is an attorney here in the city. And he's like, I can't respond right now. I have too much in my mind I want to share with you. I'll, I'll write to you tonight around 9. And it sort of went on from that. So all to say... Uh, you know, we're really psyched that you're doing this, and we're really excited, and I can just tell, listening to the other speakers, how much love they have for what they do for these patients. And I've always said, when I'm talking to, like, medical students or trainees about thinking about rare diseases, I always say it's like the trifecta. The one is that the patients need us for all the reasons that Dr. Kim was talking about, that, that it's common that doctors don't know about rare diseases, and so they need us and they need researchers and they need innovators in every way that we can imagine. So that's the first part. The second is, because they need us so much, it's just meaningful. You know, we all go into healthcare because we want to do something that feels impactful and meaningful to us and that changes our lives. And rare diseases is like that. And then the third thing is, for people that really want to have academic careers, it is a way to move forward academically. And certainly for me, I think any stake I have from a pure academic medical perspective is because I've worked with the hansky pudlak syndrome patients for so long. The only thing I want you to know is they would be the first ones to tell you they hate the name. It is what it is, and it has to do with doctors in the 50s that got their name pasted on, but they're the first ones to God, I wish we could change the name. <laughs> so, you know, you've heard a lot, and there's a little bit of anything I would have to say would just be like ditto. You know, anything you've heard about other rare diseases, is there's applicability in the HPS space. And so a lot of what you've heard about the challenges for researchers, the challenges for patients, the challenges for clinical providers, ditto for HPS. But I did want to tell you a, a little bit about life, too, because part of having a rare disease is just about getting through the day. And so early on, you heard about, you know, rare diseases can be very isolating. They can for a variety of reasons. One is it's, they're rare, and it's hard to meet other people that share your disorder. This particular person, her deal is her symptoms are so bad, she really can't be in school the way she wants to be. She's a college student in the Midwest. And it's just super frustrating to her that she's constantly having to take incompletes and redo courses because really academia, though this is changing, isn't set up in such a way that she can participate in her academic life the way she'd like to as she's managing her rare disease. This beautiful baby, her issue is going to be something she'll discover over time. And Hermansky-Pudlak syndrome is a genetic disorder. There are 10 separate mutations, all of which give you the same phenotype. One aspect of which you can tell just by seeing these pictures is albinism. Parents who have children with rare diseases, they worry about, it's an anxious life. From, from the moment those babies are born, it's an anxious life. And one of the ways that parents experience anxiety is, is my baby going to develop as I would hope they would? And so I would challenge you to think about, are there ways for technology to help us understand better what development looks like for babies? And, you know, we measure it in various ways. We measure it in terms of fine motor, language acquisition over time, gross motor. How do we share that information first with the doctors that are caring for these babies and also for the parents who are so anxious and share it in real time, not you know, when they go back to see the pediatrician at six months or their normal nine month visit, but in real time to help them manage that anxiety they feel every day. So these patients, they also are all, you know, all gonna be legally blind. They're all gonna have very, very poor visual acuity. How they experience in that, to a certain degree, depends on the person. These three women, all of whom I know, all would tell you that they're very light sensitive. And that's why they're all, two of them are wearing, well, actually, I think Carmen's wearing sunglasses too. So they're all wearing sunglasses because they're very light sensitive. 
The challenge is that you know, the assistive technology that's available to patients with, with visual disability, no matter what the cause, it's not what it needs to be. So we all use the Zoom feature at one point or another on our iPhones. One of the things I'm hoping you'll think about if you're thinking about developing an app, remember people with visual disabilities. Because the thing about that Zoom feature, unless you build the code into the app, it won't exist. And then they're stuck with doing some kind of work around. If, the, if it's in the app, then they can use their iPhone the way they're used to using it. The other thing is we don't have those same kinds of features for other media. So for example, for desktops or laptops or tablets, it's not available in the same way. The other thing is, you know, white canes are like a thing. I have this patient, Daniel, and he'll talk about coming to see me and he has to go through Grand Central. And he's like, Dr. Sewer, when I have my white cane, it's like, I'm parting the Red Sea, people just falling over themselves to get out of my way. But not every person with a visual disability, you know this, not every person with a visual disability is comfortable stating to the world, I have this disability. And so is there technology that would allow them to do what they need to do to navigate without necessarily having to declare with a white cane that that's what's going on for them? So something for you to think about as well. Carmen's using, and the reason I'm using names is these pictures that I brought to you today are all from the network, from the foundation site, and so the, all these people have said that they're okay with us using their pictures. Carmen's using a device to let her look at her phone, probably because the Zoom feature is not working. A lot of these devices, in the moment that you're using them, they actually make you quite vulnerable. If you can imagine Carmen being by herself, they're in New York City, but let's say she's in another city and let's say she's in a crowded space and she's having to use that feature in a place where she feels very uncomfortable anyway and you can begin to understand how vulnerable people can feel as they just make their way through their day. This guy, I don't know him, He's, he um, had a lung transplant just like my, my um, patient in Dallas because our, our patients, the most common genotype, the most common mutation is HPS1 and they're at 100% risk of developing interstitial lung disease early in life, sometimes even in teenage years, but almost across the board. The oldest patient I had that had symptoms initially were in their 60s, but typically like 20s, 30s, 40s. So he loves to cycle. And the other thing he loves to do, and I, I know about him because a lot of people in the community know this gentleman. The other thing he loves to do is downhill ski. And so you know what the challenge is in terms of technology. Like, how can he do that? He's got kids, and it's a little bit of like, how can he do the things that he loves and be safe doing them? And what can technology do to help? I'm aware of a company that's working on a, a, you know, a watch-based feature that allowed a woman who's completely blind to run the New York City Marathon last year. What people need to do now is they need to have someone right alongside them. But you, know, you don't necessarily always want that. And so this, this watch, it, it broke down midway, um, and he, she then had to get a friend to join her for the rest of the marathon. But the first part, going over the Verrazano Bridge, was like a mir miraculous moment for her. This is Letty. Letty was my patient. Letty passed away. She was waiting for lungs, and she passed away. Um, she was a beautiful person, and I loved Letty. When she was far along in her disease, she needed to use oxygen all the time. And this is the thing for people with more than one disability. So if you think about someone who's got a lung disease that makes them very short of breath, short of breath enough that they need to use oxygen. And she had the same visual disability that anyone with HPS is gonna have. She couldn't read the, the device that we give patients to monitor like the level of their oxygen, she couldn't read that. So it was like this frustrating moment for her every day of her life. She's like, why can't I just have the apparatus associated with oxygen that I can read just to get through the day? So I just wanted to challenge you, you know, think about something that's intrinsic to you that you think in some way makes you different, you know, and it could be your religious or cultural heritage, it could be your gender identity, it could be something about the way your mind works. And then put yourself into that rare disease space and know that that thing, because I, I know this is true for my patients and I think it's true for all of our patients that you've heard about today, that's the thing that can claim that person's life. 
The other thing I want you to think about is think about a thing that's not intrinsic to you, but that you just adore. I went to visit my friend Val just last night. Val has a form of dementia that's a rare disease. He has primary progressive aphasia. Val was an ophthalmologist who spoke six languages. And at this point in his life, he, he really is struggling just with English. And I went just to see Val and take him to dinner. I, I love Val. He's a, just a beautiful person. I think he was probably a wonderful ophthalmologist. His interest was glaucoma. He has a picture of his grandfather on, in his apartment that he treasures. He didn't really know his grandfather. His grandfather died very early in life, but there were aspects about his grandfather I think Val has always been able to see in himself. So think of that thing for you, whatever it might be, the thing you'd grab if your house is on fire and you're getting out. And then think about my friend Letty. You know, and the thing that she most treasured late in her life was oxygen. I mean, that was the thing. You know, that allowed her to have a life that felt something like the life that she loved. And think about the thing that you are now having in your head and the frustration you would feel if that very thing was the thing that you couldn't use the way you needed it to. So again, on behalf of my patients, we're so psyched you're here. You know, we're just so excited that you're here and you're focused on the people in our lives that mean so much to us. I know you're gonna come up with great ideas this weekend, and thanks so much.